Good morning. Welcome to Trade Talks. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. And joining me live from Market Site is Cheryl Young of Young & Associates, which is part of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Cheryl, thank you very much for joining us live today in studio. Congratulations on completing the New York City Marathon. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. before we get into our topic today, which is Silicon Valley, they need financial advisors as well, right? But yes. you have been in the business for a number of years, and, and I want to get your take on how much financial advisory has evolved over the past couple of decades, for better or for worse. Yeah, it's, it's changed a lot, Jill. You know, I started in this business about 20 years ago, and so when I first started, fees were much higher. There were a lot of solo advisors, and it was really focused on the portfolio. And the portfolio focus, of course, hasn't changed, but fees have been very compressed in the last 20 years. And at the same time, it's become much more of a service model. You have to do so much for your clients and much more than just around the portfolio, which I think, of course, is in clients' best interest. But we definitely have seen those fees come down and expectations of what you can deliver go up. All right. And you have an interesting mix of clients. Tell us about that. So I'm in Silicon Valley, and most of my clients are entrepreneurs. I work with a lot of uh, engineers, a lot of executives at big companies like Apple, Google, Facebook. and they are extremely driven, extremely intelligent. They have uh, very little time. And so a lot of my job is helping them understand things like concentrated stock positions, options, RSUs, tax strategies, and really helping them focus on what's going to make them the most money, which is their jobs, their startups, not watching the market every day. Right. So I would imagine they're very results driven. Very, yes. Right, <laughs> yes. right. So they, I, I would also imagine that they have a different um, strategy mix that you would incorporate into their portfolios versus traditional investment planning. I, I would agree. I am an options specialist. I do a lot of covered call strategies. And so it's a very tailored approach to how I think about clients. Um, I see a lot of concentrated positions. Clients will come in with 60, 70, sometimes 90% of their net worth tied to one single stock. And often it's, often it's a stock I like a lot. Um, and so we have to be very careful to help the client understand both tax strategies and then concentrations of just taking that much risk in just technology alone. Um, and at the same te time, technology is one of my favorite sectors right now. So it's that balance of risk reward. Right. Well, it's had quite a run this year as well. So Thankfully. <laughs> right. Right. So you're looking to pr protect these gains that you've had and then exactly. also continue to generate some income off of it, um, which, which is a goal for many registered investment advisors. And let's talk about, because you have such a wealth of experience, what are some best practices RIAs should look to while managing client portfolios? You know, first of all, you have to really understand what the client wants. And we tend to all think it's about making more money. And of course, everyone wants to make more money, but it's much deeper than that. My job is much more of a behavioral psychologist. And it's ironic because I was attracted to this business because I have a deep math background and I really liked the kind of geeky options and focusing on that math aspect of, of managing a portfolio. But it's really about helping people understand kind of their worst behaviors and some of the mental heuristics that cause them to make big financial mistakes. What's an example of bad practice, bad behavior that you uh, help a client? Like, we can't do this going forward. I'll give you an example. I have a client who's a CFO of a major company in Silicon Valley. He has gone to some of the best schools in the nation and very highly intelligent. But he, before he hired me, sold at the absolute bottom of the market in 2008. And then was so scared to get back in, he missed almost all of the recovery. Didn't get back in until 2011. We had that little blip in 2011 in August of a 19%, you know, mm -hmm. very fast drop back and up. And he sold again. And so it was that fear factor where he had just retired and he felt like he just couldn't recover and was too afraid to stay in. If he had just rented it out, we know the S&P going back has, has made 7.81 if you bet at the very worst day in October 2007, which is exactly a decade ago now. Right, right. So being consistently invested. Correct. Is, is and he, he has probably averaged less than 2% because he missed out on so much of the gains in recovery. So he finally gave up and said, I can't do this myself because I'm my own worst enemy. And that's where he turned to me for help. All right, well, let's talk about this. And if we can get your general market outlook of the S&P up over 20% on the year, the NASDAQ comp up 25%. Do you think we'll get that for 2018 or we'll get a little bit of... Uh... I, I think there's still, still some potential lift. You know, if you look at the stock market, 18 is high by multiple standard on, on the S&P. Um, if you look at other areas in the world, you know, I'll take uh, MSAI AFA, for example, it's trading closer to about 15, and emerging markets are closer to about 12.7, 12.8. And so the P ratios are much less expensive abroad than they are in the U.S. So I would be starting to look outside of the U.S. for opportunities. 
With that said, I still like technology. There's a growth story there. We've seen growth continue to outperform this year, all, double that of, of value stocks. So I think you have to be very picky in your stock selection right now. I don't expect this to be a passive market going forward because we've seen CapEx really expand. And when you have the earnings growth that we've had year over year, we've had five straight quarters, that tends to drive CapEx up. CapEx tends to drive up companies' earnings four quarters in advance. So I'm still mildly optimistic with stocks, even though we have high multiples on the S&P as a broad index. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope to see you again when you're back in from California. Yeah. And traders, as always, thank you for joining me. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Thanks, Jill.